<laughs> right. <laughs> Here we go. So welcome everyone. My name is Stephen Lowy and I am a PhD researcher at the Global Center for Advanced Studies, we affectionately call GCAS. For those of you visiting with us for the first time, GCAS has been in existence for eight years. Its mission is to make available online and at its six nodes all around the world, quality education in the humanities at the baccalaureate. So welcome everyone. My name is Stephen Lowy and I am a PhD researcher at the Global Center for Advanced Studies, we affectionately call GCAS. For those of you visiting with us for the first time, GCAS has been been in existence for eight years. Its mission is to make available online and at its six nodes all around the world quality education ahead, in the humanity at the baccalaureate. Continue on, Stephen. I don't know, but I'm getting all kinds of feedback. Um, Question. I guess we have some technical difficulties. Apologies, everyone, for, for yeah, it. Could, could people make sure if you're on the YouTube channel to mute yourself? And if everyone could mute themselves, that'd be great. Go ahead, Stephen. Okay. Um, let, let me pick it up. On, Stephen. Okay. We uh, have a bit of an infinite regress here. Stephen, is it, is it possible you've got the tab open in another browser? Have you maybe got the YouTube tab open on another part of your own computer that we're hearing back? Okay. Um, let, let me pick it up. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, have a bit of a rest. Okay. Stephen, is it, is it possible you've got the tab open in another browser? Have you maybe got the YouTube tab open on another part of your own computer that we're hearing back? Stephen, why don't you bounce out and come back in, please? Thank you. And okay. uh, welcome to everybody. Welcome, everyone. We're really pleased to have with us a very special guest, uh, one, of the, one of the great thinkers of our time, Professor Ian McGilchrist. But Professor McGilchrist will be giving us a lecture here. And so we're really pleased that he's been willing to join with us. And the respondent will be MIT Professor John Ehrensfeld, uh, retired, and he'll respond. And then after, after Professor Ehrensfeld responds, and then we will have some, maybe some moments for a QA. and a And so thank you so much. And uh, we're waiting for uh, Stephen Lowry to come back in. But um, if he, uh, yeah, so, and we are also joined with some of our professors inside the Zoom link, and so we're really excited about this. Um, Ian, why don't you do a sound check now, and it looks like you're, everything's working well, apart from Stephen's connection. Go ahead. Well, I hope so. I hope I'm not subject to the same um, process of reliving every moment. I, I do have a chapter on time in my book, and uh, maybe <laughs> maybe that would be of some help here. Uh, it sounds uh, I'm getting a thumbs up. That looks like it, that it's not repeating with me. Is that right? Yes, it's excellent connection. Thank you so much. Okay. Well, what should we do? At this stage, um, I mean, uh, uh, Stephen Lowry should come back in, but I haven't seen him. He's probably frantically looking around his computer. Uh, I'm not sure, but why don't we just um, uh, just where are you? Where are you in the world the, uh, these days, Professor McGilchrist? Oh, uh, just call me Ian. I, I'm on the Sk Isle of Skye, which is off the northwest coast of Scotland. Um, it's it's dark. It's extremely cold, <laughs> at least by British standards. And um, so I've got a fire going here and a couple of cats wandering around that may or may not obtrude. Um, and I, I'm hoping to be able to talk to you about matter and consciousness. I'll, I'll have to be quite brief, really, but uh, let me know when, when, when you'd like me to, to, to kick in. Wow, that sounds wonderful. Thank you, uh, Ian. Uh, and it sounds really cozy, even if it's cold. That's uh, kind of romantic. <laughs> okay, so Stephen has come back in. Let's, 
let's admit him. And then if there's still an issue, then we'll just continue on. Thank, thank you so much. All for right. your okay, great. Okay. Okay, good. So with Stephen, um, go okay. ahead, Stephen. Why don't you finish your introduction? Sorry about that. Okay, so um, for those of you visiting with us for the first time, GCAS has been in existence for eight years. Its mission is to make available online and add its six nodes all around the world, quality education in the humanities at the baccalaureate, master's and doctorate levels. GCAS courses are offered at either low or no tuition, making higher education available to worthy individuals who otherwise would not have the means of attending college. It also ensures students do not begin their academic careers overburdened by crushing debt. Right from the beginning, GCAS started its free public lecture series and has been honored to present such important public intellectuals as Noam Chomsky, our current honorary president, Dr. Louis Gordon, a previous honorary president, French philosopher, Hélène Bédieu, Pulitzer Prize winner, journalist and political activist for change, Chris Hedges, and philosopher Thomas Metzinger, among others. This evening, it is our very great honor to introduce to our audience psychiatrist, neuroscientist, and philosopher of science, Dr. Ian McGilchrist. He first distinguished himself as a literary scholar and professor of literature at Oxford. His first book, Against Criticism, published in 1982, took up the themes in the literary realm of the particular and the unique versus the general and the categorical, the implicit versus the explicit, and the importance of context and embodiment. Frustrated with the Academy's obsession for literary analysis, reduction to theory, and the disembodiment of literature, he returned to Oxford as a student of medicine and psychiatry. He was influenced by John Cutting's work in psychopathology and brain hemispheres, and Louis Sass's 1992 book, A Study of Culture, Madness and Modernity. These influences, among others, and themes carried over from Against Criticism were explored through an extensive, a very extensive review of research in Ian's own book, The Master and His Emissary, The Divided Brain in the Making of the Western World, which was published by Yale University Press in 2009 to international critical acclaim. In it, Ian presents a groundbreaking new theory of the relationship between the two hemispheres, in which he argues that the capacities of the right hemisphere allow for the perception of irreducible wholes to emerge, life as it is experienced, as in a gestalt, while the capacities of the left hemisphere focus the individual narrowly on the abstracted, minute details of life. The scientific evidence is that this relationship between the two hemispheres is a biological evolutionary development when needed for our survival. It is a relationship Ian maintains is reflected in the culture at large and is very hard to miss once recognized. He further argues that in balance, the relationship between these two points of view and attention to both the whole and to the part give rise to civilization. But an imbalance created by a domineering left hemisphere, therefore too much disembodied detail, undermines civilization and threatens its destruction. The situation that we all now find ourselves in for the most part. On November 9th of this year, Ian published a new book that took 10 years to research and write, entitled The Matter with Things, Our Brains, Our Delusions, and the Unmaking of the World. In this work, he expands the context for his theory of brain laterality in the philosophy of science, epistemology, ontology, cosmology, physics, and metaphysics. It is on material from this work that he will lecture this evening. Afterwards, in response to Dr. McGilchrist's lecture, we will hear comment and questions from John, John Ehrensfeld. Dr. Ehrensfeld, previously the director of the MIT Program on Technology, Business and Environment, is a prolific writer having co-authored and co-authored over 200 papers, books, reports, and other publications. His most recent book, The Right Way to Flourish, Reconnecting with the Real World, was published by Rutledge in 2020. Now, without further ado, I'd like to extend a very warm GCAS welcome to both Ian and John. Th thank you very much. Um, and uh, that was a lovely introduction. Uh, <clears throat> as you gather, I've, I've recently published a few weeks ago, a very long book, it's about 1500 pages. One of the chapters, chapter 25, 
deals with the relationship between matter and consciousness. And uh, it's, it's of a, a small book's length itself. Um, and I'm going to talk really in very much headline and note form. So people will have to forgive me that I can't, um, I can't really um, give very much in the way of um, support to what I'm saying. I'm mainly giving you my conclusions. Um, but the argument is all there in the book for those of you who want to read it. So here are a few reflections at any rate on the issues of matter and consciousness. One of my great heroes, William James, wrote, mental and physical events are on all hands admitted to present the strongest contrast in the entire field of being. The chasm which yawns between them is less easily bridged over by the mind than any interval we know. Um, and uh, another great writer, Sir Charles Sherrington, the late 19th century English physiologist wrote, for myself, what little I know of the how of the one does not, speaking personally, even begin to help me toward the how of the other. The two, for all I can do, remain refractorily apart. They seem to be disparate, not mutually convertible, untranslatable the one into the other. These important insights uh, leave us with a conundrum. How are we going to approach this problem? I think one of the things I'd like to point out is Sir Charles Sherrington using the expression the how, because one of the main differences between the hemispheres is the how of the attention or, or the way in which they approach the world, the attention that they dispose towards the world. And it's this that gives rise to a different experiential phenomenal world in either case. I haven't got time to go into the thesis of um, the master and his emissary or, or its expansion, great expansion with enormously increased reference to the neurological literature in The Matter With Things, my recent book. But here, here we will just try and focus on one or two of the, the main problems in trying to tackle this, this issue. It was probably Lucretius who first pointed out that there must be some very strong parallel between the brain and the mind. He believed, in fact, that the brain must give rise to mind because he noted that affections of the brain or drugs or epilepsy um, changed the mind. And he assumed that the, the mind must be dependent on the brain. And in an era in which we can watch brain scans which apparently show us the brain giving rise to experience it's hard to resist this conclusion but in fact it's um jumping to a conclusion it's it's a absolutely <clears throat> groundless although perfectly reasonable assumption um when two things move in parallel um you don't know whether the one causes the other or the other causes the one or both are themselves the consequence of a third element altogether. And equally compatible with the observation that the brain and the mind move so often together uh, is that the brain might emit consciousness, the, the um, if you like, received wisdom of mainstream science, or it could transmit consciousness or a third possibility, it could permit consciousness. I will argue for this third possibility, uh, or at least I will <laughs> nail my colors to the mast on this particular possibility. Arguing for it, uh, I hardly have much time for, but I will um, hint at some of the reasons I make this um, suggestion. The reason that the first and most improbable uh, idea the idea that the brain somehow emits consciousness enjoys such prestige is that we think we understand matter and it's a good principle in science to start from something you understand towards something that you don't however the more we know about matter the less we understand it and physicists will tell you that matter is every bit as difficult to understand or explain as consciousness and that indeed it can't be explained without invoking consciousness and so we're really no further forward if we try to explain consciousness by referring to the brain what's more nobody has the slightest idea how the brain could if it really is uh, and that's a big 
if if the brain itself is really unconscious and all matter is completely without consciousness there is no way in which it can somehow secrete consciousness nobody has the foggiest idea how this could ever happen there's a lot of hand waving and uh, gesturing towards what's often referred to as emergence but emergence is a sort of black box, really. It says, I don't know what happened here, perhaps a miracle, and something comes out of the box, which looked completely different from anything that went into it. There is no possibility, I, I would say, and I, again, I haven't got time to, to argue more forcefully for this, but there is no possibility that something that completely lacks consciousness wholly lacks consciousness can give rise to consciousness if you smuggle a bit of consciousness in at the start then you haven't found the origin of consciousness so this leaves us really with a number of possibilities we could for example deny the existence of consciousness altogether it has been done i will come back to that you could deny the existence of matter on the other hand something that perhaps some buddhists would do or you could accept that they both exist, but are totally distinct. You could assert, on the other hand, that they each exist, but are the same. Or you could entertain the possibility that they're distinct phenomena that reflect different aspects of a nonetheless importantly indivisible reality. I think that pretty much covers the ground. I'll comment very briefly, I'm afraid, uh, because that's all I've time for on each of these possibilities. Well, uh, the fact that some people, uh, even people who hold down um, chairs at um, reputable universities hold that uh, consciousness might not exist is one of the great um, uh, hilarious spectacles of our time, really. Uh, as um, has been often pointed out, um, there is no such thing as consciousness being an illusion, because it has to be an illusion within some kind of a consciousness. That's what we mean by illusion. Um, it, it, there has to be something to be eluded. Uh, also, it's impossible to um, make this statement about consciousness not existing without using consciousness and invoking consciousness in your hero. As the a mainstream Anglo-American analytic philosopher Galen Strawson uh, writes, uh, some philosophers are prepared to deny the existence of consciousness, and at this we should stop and wonder. I think we should feel very sober and a little afraid at the power of human credulity, the capacity of human minds to be gripped by theory, by faith. For this particular denial is the strangest thing that has ever happened in the whole history of human thought, not just the whole history of philosophy. It falls, unfortunately, to philosophy, not religion, to reveal the deepest woo-woo of the human mind. I find this grievous. But next to this denial, every known religious belief is only a little less sensible than the belief that grass is green. You could, I suppose, as an alternative, if you can't find a way of reconciling consciousness with matter, deny the existence of matter. And as I say, some spiritual traditions have tried this gambit, but I don't think it's very satisfactory. It, it smacks of an easy way out of a very genuine problem, an enigma, a conundrum that we confront every day in our experience. And even the most sophisticated meditators are still subject very much to material limitations on their life, starting with the functions and actions of their own bodies, their coming death, and the uh, the circumstances which they have to encounter every day in simply eating, moving about and staying alive. So I'm not a fan of that solution any more than I am of the denial of the existence of consciousness. Well, you could, like uh, Descartes, accept that they exist, but that you simply can't see how they could possibly interact. They're totally distinct. This was his problem of um, res extensa and, and the... Um, uh, Res um, mentis, uh, I can't think of the word now. Um, uh, but uh, th th these two aspects of life could not be brought together. Um, and uh, we now know very obviously that the con that consciousness can affect the mind. Things like certain kinds of very simple therapies can change the brain. Um, things like the placebo effect declare to us every day that. Um, 
the uh, that that uh, physical causes can make changes in the mind, um, and so uh, uh, and beliefs can change matter. So we can't really accept that they don't interact. They very obviously do. Or we could um, assert that they each exist. Um, but there are too many very obvious differences between matter and consciousness. I can take consciousness wherever I like. I can't put my hand through the table in front of me. This seems like a rather basic difference between them. Alternatively, and this is the one uh, alternative that I would embrace, we could entertain the possibility that they're distinct phenomena that reflect different aspects of a nonetheless importantly invisible uh, reality. So in sum on this brief reflection, it seems that mind and matter have a close relationship. We can say that, that we cannot logically dismiss the existence of consciousness and ought to be unwilling to dismiss the existence of matter, that they're not so distinct that they cannot interact, that neither are they in identical, and yet they may be aspects of one and the same reality. Nonetheless, they're not equal, in that there is reason to believe that consciousness is prior ontologically to matter. This is a point that has been made by many distinguished um, physicists in the last hundred years, including Max Planck and Niels Bohr, uh, uh, and many others, um, uh, some of whom I refer to in the book. And it is just a matter of observation that I know that my experience of matter depends on consciousness. I don't know that my experience of consciousness depends on matter. It might do or it might not. It remains an open question. Um, is consciousness then perhaps not just in us, but in the whole cosmos and everything that exists. And this is the view known as panpsychism or panexperientialism. And uh, to cut a very long story short, as I say, I do apologize for giving very little um, explanation of why I reach these conclusions, but I simply can have time only to talk about some of my conclusions tonight. I do myself embrace a position of panexperientialism that there is inwardness to the cosmos and that consciousness cannot itself be reduced to anything else. It's therefore an ontological primary. We cannot get behind it, beyond it, or uh, explain it in terms of any other thing that exists. And this is a point that's not that unusual or rarefied these days. A lot of mainstream Western philosophers are now embracing panpsychism. And in their um, Oxford Companion to the Mind, uh, Colin Blakemore and Ramachandran, V.S. Ramachandran, two very well known and mainstream neuroscientists accept that we may have to just um, take it on the chin that consciousness is one of the building blocks of the universe. I believe it is, in fact, the origin of all that exists. Are neurons, uh, let alone brains, necessary for this process of awareness? Well, there are many interesting cases in which this is obviously um, uh, uh, up for uh, some doubt, I would say. Um, there's a famous uh, case described by, um, I think his name is John Lauber, um, a physician who looked after a young man who had a first in mathematics from Leeds University, an IQ of 126, and functioned entirely normally, who had, in the words of Lorber, almost no brain. It's a bit of an exaggeration. Uh, he had a thin rim of cortex, but most of the space inside his skull was taken up by fluid, and the weight of his brain would have been an order of magnitude smaller than most people's. One can go further. There is a condition called hydranencephaly. Um, you may have heard of or know of a condition called hydrocephalus, in which indeed there is more of the space in the cranium taken up by CSF, cerebrospinal fluid, than is normally the case, 
But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a condition called hydroanencephaly. It's rather rare. And what it means is that there's effectively no brain, but that the space um, above the brain stem is taken up with um, CSF. A group of about 18 such subjects have been studied and have been found obviously not to um, have normal intelligence and understanding, but nonetheless to do a remarkable number of things, to be able to recognize different people, to respond appropriately to them, to have favorite toys, to respond to music, to be able to recognize themselves in a mirror, which is always thought to be a sign of um, higher consciousness and so forth. Then we know that uh, creatures that we would consider really quite lowly, such as insects, can make simple mathematical calculations um, and act uh, purposefully towards ends to which they could not have been programmed um, by their genes because the particular um, purposes that are required are not ones that evolution would have prepared them for. Going perhaps even further, Slime moulds, um, something fairly uh, simple and basic, which you might find in your cellar or basement if you have one. Slime moulds are very simple. Obviously, they have no neurons at all. They're just aggregations of cells, simple cells together to form um, a, a sort of plasma. And uh, slime molds are quite canny. They, uh, people who experiment with them and grow them in labs have to lock them in for the night because they um, will frequently escape from their dishes and wander around the lab. Uh, much more interestingly, they can solve mazes uh, in, in the way that rats can solve mazes. And if you cut a piece off a slime mold that has solved a maze uh, 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 and then experiment with the maze, the mold will, this part of the mold will remember and be able to solve um, the maze. More generally, plants appear to have astonishing capacity for not just responding automatically, but making sophisticated decisions. The decision whether or not to uh, bloom at any one time is made by taking into account about 15 different factors, not just the temperature of the air. Um, but, of course, one could argue that maybe that was a purely mechanical um, effect. Um, th there is a plant you will probably know, Mimosa pudica, commonly called the sensitive plant, that if you touch it, the leaves will close up. Um, if you carry on touching it and it finds that nothing much happens to it, it will stop closing up because closing up expends energy. And if it doesn't have to and it learns it doesn't have to, then it will stop doing so. You might say, well, it's just the, the response is fatigued, um, which is a technical term in, in, in biology, which means that if you constantly stimulate a certain um, pathway, eventually it will cease to respond. But this is not the case, because if instead you drop a drop of water on the sensitive plant leaf, it will instantly close. So it's able to discriminate between the difference between your finger and a drop of water. Um, fairly impressive, but not as impressive as this experiment conducted by uh, Monica Galliano, I think. Um, and it's, it, um, um, I hope I will be able to explain it simply. It's, it's very well thought through. Pea plants were grown in an environment starved of light. They obviously need um, light in order to thrive. And so it's important for them to maximize the occurrence of light when it comes. And in this experimental setup, a light does in fact come on for periods of time in a Y-shaped structure that is over the bed where the plants are growing. Now, it's obviously advantageous for them to grow towards the light. However, the light comes on at random down one or other of the arms. So you'd think that would create an insuperable problem. However, the experimenters decided um, that they would allow the um, random the, the machine that was randomly programmed to send a puff of air down the arm of the tube down which light would come sometime before the light came on. And they found that after about three days, the plants learnt something that they could never have been programmed to know, that they should make an effort to grow towards the arm down which the puff of air came, because that was the one uh, down which the light would come. 
Now, if you're uh, um, determined to be sceptical, you might say, well, there might be some strange thing in nature where light comes from the direction that a puff of air comes from. I, I don't know of any such thing, neither did the experimenters. But they decided to set up um, a control experiment um, in which the um, puff of air came down the arm of the tube, which would not subsequently show the light. So it was the inverse relationship between the stimulus and the follow-up event. And the plants in this situation equally learnt um, to grow towards the arm down which the puff of air had not come. I took some time to explain that because I think it's it's worth reflecting on. There are many, many other interesting stories from botany. Um, and uh, so uh, I, I would love to be able to tell you some of them, but let's leave that one at that. Single cells indeed possess intelligence. James Shapiro, um, a professor of um, cell biology, says the single cell is intelligent. And Barbara McClintock, who won a Nobel Prize um, for her work in molecular genetics in the 1980s or 90s, um, in her Nobel Prize acceptance speech, commented on the extraordinary fact that organisms seem to know that something is missing or lacking um, and act to rectify it without there being, as it were, a possible pre-programmed pathway, because once again, sometimes they were subjected to insults or adversities for which there was no, um, no evolutionary um, model. Um, so much for life. Um, I, I, <laughs> how about inanimacy? Does it have consciousness? Um, you might say, well, uh, does the mountain behind my house have consciousness? Surely you can't believe that. Um, if it does, of course, it doesn't have consciousness um, in the way that you or I have it. But what would it look like if it did have consciousness? Uh, I think there's a kind of reverse anthropomorphism here, which is that we think that we're the only conscious beings and what we do with consciousness is we go to uh, Walmart or, or I must say for an American audience, I would normally say Sainsbury's, but let's say Walmart. I'd go to Walmart, mow the lawn, drink a beer. Um, I don't expect the mountain behind my house to do any of these, but we don't know whether it is conscious or not. Um, it, it would follow uh, possibly from a hard distinction between inanimacy and animacy um that this might well be the case but in fact i believe there is a continuum between inanimacy and animacy um, i don't believe there is a possible continuum with between total lack of consciousness and the advent of consciousness there can't be just a tiny bit of consciousness but there can be the simplest beginnings of life life is something that lies on a continuum and what is the difference between life and the inanimate? Uh, I would say two important things, that animacy life speeds up enormously in the order of billions fold the rate of becoming. I believe that all things are in a state of becoming, that nothing is, strictly speaking, just being, but always in a state of development or flux. As Heraclitus said, um, all things flow, and as um, Taoists believe, um, everything that exists exists in a flow. Um, I happen to believe that is philosophically and scientifically um, a, a robust observation. And this process of becoming is sp speeded up, as I say, um, uh, incalculably um, by the business of living. Actually, it was interesting you pointed out, I must make this aside, by A.N. Whitehead, a philosopher for whom I have the deepest respect, that if the business of the complexity and development of life is in the interest of survival, it's probably going in the wrong direction, because um, as uh, creatures develop and become more highly evolved, th their survival becomes much more precarious. There are some very, very ancient and extremely simple organisms called actinobacteria living in the depths of the oceans, single examples of which may be as much as a million years old. As things become more complex and become large trees, they may live for hundreds of years. 
when they become um, apes and, and humans, they don't live that long. So um, it, it is clearly the drive is not just about survival, but about something else, increase in complexity, beauty and responsiveness. And I think that is the other thing that distinguishes life. The first one is this speeding up of becoming. Um, and the other is an increase in responsiveness. Now, I believe that the cosmos is, and again, this, you just have to take this as my point of view, but I think there is a lot of evidence that the cosmos is responsive, that whatever exists is responsive, that everything exists in relationship. In fact, in the book, I argue that um, relationships are prior to relata, prior to the things that are related. Um, that everything exists in a relationship and the relationship is always implies a two way um, reverberation or resonance uh, between two elements. This is borne out by contemporary physics as well as being, I think, a deeply grounded philosophical and ancient observation. And I think that probably one of the reasons, if there are reasons at all, for the whole business of the unfolding of the cosmos that we are able to observe is the coming into being of two things, really, individuation out of wholeness without that individuation in any way um, uh, endangering the, that wholeness, but in fact enriching and fulfilling it. And the other is ever-increasing responsiveness in which, as I think Whitehead would say, um, the grounding force of being, whatever we like to call it, God or the Logos or um, the Chinese called it Li and in Sanskrit it's called Rita uh, and so on. Th these, this, this whatever it is, is in a constant evolution and dialogue with whatever it is bringing into being and thereby both becomes more itself and knows itself better. So ultimately, I think I would say that um, matter is not at all separate from consciousness, but is a necessary part of consciousness. I would say that it is a phase of consciousness, and I use the word phase there, not in the sense of a temporal phase that comes before or after consciousness, but in the sense of um, the way that um, phys uh, physicists and chemists talk about water having phases. In one phase it is fluid and translucent and moves freely over your, your body. In, the other, in another case it is ice, in which it is hard, it is opaque, it won't move until pushed, and it's so hard it can split your head open. And in another it is so diffused that it cannot be seen at all. Which of these is water? In a way, they are all water. These are just different phases of water. They don't look like one another any more than consciousness and matter look like one another, but they may have a similar um, uh, 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 relationship in the sense that they are related manifestations of an underlying um, uh, 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 ontological element. Um, and what does matter add? It adds resistance. Um, I argue in the book, and again, I haven't got time to go into it, that resistance is essential to creation, that nothing can exist without resistance. In fact, nothing exists without its opposite. Um, in part three of the book, in which I turn what we've learned in parts one and two, which are really about how do we know anything at all? How can we rely on any kind of knowledge, epistemology? When we turn that on the cosmos, what do we find? And one of the first things I want to emphasize in that part three of the book is that it is a cosmos in which there is a coincidence of opposites and that the one and the many are both needed and both exist and are aspects of one and the same um, existence. So matter offers resistance and it offers a degree of permanence for a while. Um, uh, again, it, 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 nothing um, is ever um, um, eternal or everlasting that we know, nothing in this world is, but matter allows things to endure and have permanence for a bit longer than if they weren't associated with matter. So matter is part of consciousness that offers the all important element of resistance without which nothing would come forth. And it offers um, a degree of permanence, which also means that everything doesn't collapse, um, spatially and temporally into that unity again. 
So why do we have um, brains at all? Um, well, uh, I think one of the most popular ideas is that something to do with a very, very complex network um, uh, gives rise to consciousness. There are a couple of problems with this. Um, there is absolutely no reason to suppose that something that doesn't have consciousness within it can be made to produce consciousness just by making it very complex. Um, it, it's very easy to refer to that and to gloss over the fact that there is an unbridgeable um, <coughs> uh, epistemological gap between the notion of the simple and the complex um, in, in the sense that the one doesn't have consciousness and the other one apparently does. I, I don't see how complexity gives rise to this, and I've, I've read various theories about it. More importantly, perhaps, or at least as importantly, is that the brain um, could be thought of as two entities, the cerebrum, which is what we normally think of as the brain, the new brain, the one indeed, which is the seat of most of our conscious existence. But there is a part that contributes to our existence, although it's incapable of consciousness, which is the cerebellum. It's a good deal smaller in volume than the cerebrum. Uh, as probably everyone remembers from school, it's ancient, it sits at the back of the brain, um, somewhere at the base of the skull, inside uh, the head. Um, and we now know that it's actually important for many aspects of our existence, not just for motor coordination, which is what it used to be thought to be responsible for. But the important point here is that however complex and however many neurons there are in the cerebrum, there are four times as many neurons in the cerebellum as there are in the cerebrum, and yet it does not sustain consciousness. For those who might be thinking, well, yes, okay, it may have more neurons, so effectively there must be enormous complexity, but perhaps they're not so complexly interconnected. This is not true either. The cerebellum is massively um, self-interconnected and some of the most sophisticated and most massively connected cells in the entire central nervous system, Purkinje cells, exist only in the cerebellum. So I doubt that it's for that. My own uh, speculation is that through being material, there is something about the brain that enables consciousness, and don't ask me quite how consciousness and the brain are connected, because um, no more than any other living person can I tell you the answer to that, but clearly they, they do have a connection, I don't think it makes them equal to one another or mutually dependent on one another, but the individual consciousness and the individual brain clearly have a close relationship during our uh, mortal life. Um, how do we how do we understand its role? I understand it as important for the process that I started out by talking about, that of permission. It offers a certain kind of resistance by being material. William Blake, who's a poet for whom I have enormous love and a great um, respect, wrote, how do you know but every bird that cuts the airy way is an immense world of delight closed by your senses five. That word closed is really interesting, isn't it? Because I suppose most of us would think of the senses as the portals um, whereby as it were, whatever is going on inside is open to something else. But that word closed is really interesting because it suggests to me the action of something which is like a filter and again, I don't have time to go into that idea, which is not original to me. Um, in fact, I believe Aldous Huxley held that the brain was a kind of filter. But what it does is it individuates consciousness by passing it through this individual brain. And it gives it a degree of permanence so that the thoughts don't just come and go ad lib and go all over the cosmos, but actually have some kind of consistency for a while. And the image I like very much here also comes from William James, um, who said, it's rather like my voice. Without the vocal cords, the air could pass from my lungs um, out through my mouth, but there would be no sound. Uh, there would be no individual me able to speak. It's because of the resistance offered by the vocal cords that it comes into being. I'm going to stop very soon because I'd like to leave time for comments and questions, but I'm just going to 
uh, because somebody will be thinking, is consciousness wholly personal? I, I don't believe it is. <clears throat> I believe it both is personal and not wholly so. How can that be? Again, William James had the idea that it was rather like the way in which islands um, emerge above the ocean and appear to be separate entities, while indeed they are simply different manifestations in different places of the bedrock under the ocean. But another way of thinking of it, um, more uh, convenient perhaps for, uh, or, or <laughs> congenial perhaps to biologists, is to think of it as rather like a living cell in which there can be outpouchings, there can be uh, cilia, there can be um, pseudopods or, or whatever you like, um, it, it, uh, of cytoplasm that go out into extensions. And if you were inside one of these um, columns, if you like, you would you would look around and think uh, I'm enclosed on all sides, not noticing that there was a very small place at the foot in which you were in fact continuous with the whole cytoplasm of the cell. Um, I, I won't expand on that, I'll just leave that like so much I'm afraid I've left very unfinished but just resonating I hope a little with some listeners. Thank you very much. Well that was excellent Ian, we really appreciate all the, all, all the hard work you, that you're doing, the new book, and the lecture you've just given on matter and consciousness. I'd like to now ask John Ehrensfeld to, to respond to you. Um, John, would you like to proceed? Sure. Uh, first, Ian, it is a, a extraordinary pleasure to share this uh, appearance with you. Uh, you have been a... Uh, perhaps the most important person in my life for the last two or three years since I read The Master and His Emissary. Um, That's wonderful. It has uh, shaped uh, my writing, my thinking, my teaching, and um, <clears throat> I do believe it will shape the world in some time. Uh, and as you have uh, written in your new book. I am reading it. I must admit I haven't finished it. Uh, <laughs> that uh, paradigms are uh, slow to be taken up because they, uh, uh, they threaten our consciousness. They, they threaten what our consciousness has uh, made us believe is the reality out there. So I am uh, delighted to be here and, and I, uh, uh, I again think these <clears throat> ideas are, are uh, of uh, extraordinary importance. Uh, I'm not a neuroscientist and I'm not a philosophy. I'm trained as an engineer and I've spent a lot of my life trying to make things happen. And so my interest in all of this is largely uh, the implications for uh, dealing with what you point out so, so, so vividly, that we're in deep doo-doo, that the construction of our brain has, has the consciousness that it has produced has led us down uh, the wrong path and that we're kind of dangling at the precipice. So while I, I can't really comment on your uh, uh, intriguing and I think very convincing discussion of the nature of conscience, consciousness and its relationship to the idea of matter. What, what strikes me as, as critically important is, is that another point you make about consciousness. You make that consciousness is always about something. And it's that aboutness that really concerns me because that aboutness in my way of looking at the world is what we might call reality. Mm. That is that the, the, what, what we experience through our consciousness is what we think is the world that shows up for us in which we act. So I'm more, concerned about the errors that our consciousness, given the way our brains, our modern brains are configured, uh, 
can be dealt with. I think you've very carefully shown why they're there. Uh, but you, even in the new book, are, I think, concerned about that, giving us some thoughts. I have tried to do that in my own writing, but I'd, I'd like to, to take your notions of consciousness and put them in that more practical context and ask you to maybe make some comments there. Well, well, thank you very much indeed. Uh, that's very kind of you. Um, and um, uh, it, it's, it's extraordinarily difficult for me because I can see one or two questions have been put up in the chat. And um, uh, one, uh, what I'm really thinking is, it was foolish of me to think that I could talk about matter and consciousness without raising all kinds of problems that I appear to have glossed over. Um, I, I did that as an act of self-sacrifice in a way because I have many, many things to say about it. And as you know from looking in the book, my chapter on matter and consciousness is is um, 80 something or nearly 90 pages long, I think. And, and so there is a great deal of argument and discussion about it. Um, and I really can't, you know, fend off all the things that would occur okay. to somebody who hasn't read it. So, um, but really, the main well, theme of it, of course, is the main theme of it is about the difference between the two brain hemispheres and how they bring to existence for us two quite different qualities of consciousness. The two consciousnesses that have different qualities, two different takes on the world, and I think it's that that you're overall referring to there, um, because I argue that through the way in which public discourse has evolved in the last couple of hundred years, only a certain kind of thinking, which is very characteristic of people with right hemisphere brain damage. I mean, I, I can be entirely scientific about this. When you, when you suppress the right hemisphere experimentally, when people have strokes in it, and when people have conditions, psychological conditions in which their right hemisphere is hypofunctional, then they start to think in the, exactly the sort of ways that we now think as a culture. So it, it's, it's quite a specific hypothesis. Um, I, I, again, I can't possibly um, go into a, 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 a way of explaining it to people who haven't read what I've read. All I would say is please don't dismiss it on the basis that everything you know about hemispheres is, is some kind of pop psychology and it's all been rubbish. I mean, that, that's going back um, 15 years, at least before um, I um, published The Master in His Emissary, which is um, a completely new way of thinking about this important undeniable division between the two parts of the brain. But I do, as you say, believe that we, we actually have an awareness of what is missing. So that many people respond to what I write by saying, um, somehow you woke up in me something that I knew was there but had been disattending to or deliberately suppressing, but which is unarguably true and present and is a, you know, a deep feeling that I've always had but have had no words to express it and no arguments for it. You have given me arguments and facts and a way of understanding it. So thank you. That's really what I aim to do in this new book. Yeah, well, I think you do. I have, I did, I have not finished the book, but I did read this chapter or the part on matter and consciousness uh, because I knew yes. I would have to uh, respond to you. Um, the, uh, uh, um, not being a, I, uh, it, it stands out from, I, I, I think it's different from a lot of, of what you have written in both books. This, this particular chapter, that it okay. is uh, addressing a, a question that has been in, in the, uh, the field, in the area of philosophy, uh, a basic question from the get-go. Uh, you have yes. uh, cited in, in the talk today and in the book, uh, uh, philosophers that go back to pre, even to the pre-Socratic era uh, on this issue of matter, consciousness yes yes, yes. no um, absolutely well how, yes as i said how, how for for us who are not philosophers how Sorry? can this part of your book 
help in the same way that your bihemispheric model of the brain, which you, you, you sort of weave into this, help well, to enhance our, our ability to absorb what you're writing? Well, how can I say? It's been pointed out to me that the most in his hemisphere has very important philosophical implications, some of which I expanded in chapters four, five, and six of that book. But it, it's taken me till now, slightly paradoxically, to ask the question, you know, who are we? What is the world? And how do we know how we relate to it? And to answer that question involves addressing the issue that there are two kinds of world or two complete phenomenal phenomenologically different worlds brought into being for us by our brains with different qualities that appear to contradict one another how can that be um, and that question needs to be addressed and that's what i address in part one and, and i believe that um i i show that one of the two hemispheres is universally less veridical that's it's better able to help us manipulate the world but it's less able to understand it now if that's true and if we can see the hallmark, the imprint of the left hemisphere, what it does to reality when it's the one that is telling us this is what it is like. If we can recognize it, we know that it is less veridical. Now that actually is a step forward in philosophy. I hope that is something that people will take on board. Then in the second part of the book, I talk about science, reason, intuition, and imagination, and the ways in which they help us understand things. And in brief, I think they're all important, and we mustn't do away with any of them, um, and that they complement one another rather than contradict one another, and that it indeed in every case, including in science and reason, it is the right hemisphere that gives us um, a better understanding. And finally, in the last part of the book, I sort of ask questions about, you know, what is time? What is space? Matter? Consciousness? What is the structure of this world? What are values? Um, is the purpose? What is the sense of the sacred? These are all questions that are important. They're sometimes, some of them not popular with scientists, some of them are popular. But nonetheless, I believe I have an entirely coherent picture of the cosmos to offer here, which is different from the one that's seems to me intellectually enormously simplistic and morally and spiritually bankrupt, that of reductionist materialism. I've noticed that there's a question in the chat from um, an MA student who would like, and I see that he has joined us. Um, I saw his face for a short while, but he's hidden it again. But <laughs> he's, he's put in a perfectly good question, and I'm very happy to address it. I can I can make my face reappear. It's still here. Um, <laughs> I just followed the convention, uh, but yeah, that would be. I, okay. I would appreciate that. Of course, obviously, I'm coming from a totally naive perspective. I've I have a I've studied neuroscience actually in my bachelor's, but I've never encountered your your work. So I'm very curious. No, okay. um, yeah. No, certainly, Florian. Yeah, carry on. No, no, I'm just I'm very I'm very curious to sort of. So if we sort of in a classical neuro, neuroscience way, of course, we would say consciousness is the awareness of something. Well, someone's awareness of something happening. Right. So the difference. So so how especially in the examples that you gave with the, the plants and the, and the animals, how can we say that sort of these reactions um, amount to consciousness as opposed to just sort of, yeah, a, a type of conditioning or, or um, sort of reacting to stimulus? Because because how can we infer that's I think a deep problem always. How can we infer uh, intentionality, maybe, and, and does that even matter for for consciousness as you understand it? Intentionality and awareness of what's going on. In a way? Well, um, yes, of course, the, the inf inference of intentionality can be taken uh, as a problem to enormous degrees by the the, the entirely skeptic. Uh, I mean, Descartes himself, and sorry, I, the word I couldn't think of was res cogitans, you know, the, his res cogitans and res extensa. But, but he himself said, if I look out of the window and see people walking about, how do I know that they're not just machines covered in cats, uh, hats and coats? Well, you can take it that far, but I believe that if you do actually think that, then you've probably got a, something rather like a very severe schizo-autistic um, uh, uh, condition um, which, which, which is um, 
perfectly okay, but it, it, it stops conversation because most of us believe that it's perfectly reasonable to suppose that the people we live amongst um, do have inward life. Um, until the 1970s, it was thought that babies had no consciousness and that it was perfectly all right to operate on them without an anaesthetic. In fact, I believe it was only in the 1980s that the American Medical Association said that it was on the whole not good practice to operate on babies um, without an anaesthetic. And then, of course, it goes down to dogs and, you know, Descartes saying they were just creaking machines and so forth, that their cries of pain were not real. And, and you can take it further and you can take it to plants and you can say, well, you know, I don't see them doing the things I do with consciousness, so how do I know that they've got any kind of awareness? The sort of awareness you talk about, defined of awareness of thoughts and actions, is a very special kind because depending on what you mean by action, and Aristotle defined four kinds, um, only one of which is um, the kind of action that we make, um, but plants act. Darwin himself said that all parts of a plant are constantly constantly engaged in something he called circumnutation with an N, which means a constant circling and exploring of the environment. Their roots are doing it all the time, their branches do it as well. Um, but the awareness of thoughts and actions is possibly something that is very peculiar to humans. I, I, I wouldn't say that um, monkeys, I, I would be very loath to deny consciousness to a monkey or to a dog, but I doubt that it's aware of thoughts or aware of its actions in a self-conscious way. There is self-consciousness, which is the awareness of awareness, which is a reflexive thing, which is, you know, perhaps a blessing, perhaps a curse. It's a, it's a fact about human beings that we have evolved this. But it's not the same as awareness. And as, as I say, Barbara McClintock, um, Nobel Prize winning my, um, molecular biologist pointed out, and James Shapiro, a professor of cell biology, Cells have intelligence. There is no other word for it. What do we mean by intelligence? We mean not just reacting by programming, not just reacting by the way in which a machine would react if it searched something and it had been showed that if it did this, this would be the response to that. They are able to find intelligent solutions to problems for which they have no possible way of being, quote, programmed. By the way, the whole idea that we, or any kind of living organism, is programmed by its genes is something I take apart in chapter 12 of my book. Um, <clears throat> the whole idea that it's all there in some genetic program is woefully lacking, and it doesn't stand up either rationally or to any scientific evidence. <clears throat> I'm sure you will say, well, I can't believe that. But, <clears throat> you know, if you'd like to read chapter 12 of my new book, The Matter with Things, I think you'll find things there that will make, uh, not necessarily convince you, I can't convince everybody, but should give you some cause for thought. And I'm not alone here. I'm not sort of standing out against um, people who are mainstream biologists. So there we are. I hope that I probably won't satisfy you because, of course, we'd have to sit down with a beer and talk for an hour or two, but um, it's all I can do for now, Flo. Thank you very much for your question. Thanks a lot. Ian, I'd like to raise um, a point you make, uh, an important point you make about um, relationship being prior to relata, the elements of the relationship. It kind of suggests yeah. a, um, um, Plato's theory, theory of forms and uh, an idealism about that. Um, could you respond to that? It's also reflected in, you know, Plotinus' work being a Neoplatonist. Um, could you respond to, to that? Um, well, I don't immediately see it as analogous to Plato's idea of ideas, um, which I see more as... Um, abstractions from the embodied experience of existence, which is the only thing we have to go on. Um, although Plato was a great myth maker, he was also the start of a process which held philosophy captive in the West for about 18, uh, well, probably longer, 2000 years. Um, he and Aristotle between them, the whole idea that a thing and its contrary cannot be true at the same time um, is, um, you know, an important problem. Um, and, and so is the, the idea of ideas being fundamental and that whatever we see is just, as it were, 
an imperfect reflection of something that we've never seen and cannot know. Um, I, I, I'm temperamentally and philosophically disinclined to this position and argue against it in the book. However, what I do think is that, as, it, as you point out, that um, I, I said this, that relationships are prior to relata. Mm. And uh, there are a number of ways of thinking of this. Um, one is the importance of context. A thing only is what it is by virtue of the context in which it is. Once you've taken something out of the context, you've changed what it is. I started noticing this very early on when I was engaged in the process of um, analysing and criticising works of art and literature, that once you had um, paraphrased them and taken the thoughts and the ideas out of the very words in which they were embodied, you had something completely different from what you'd started with. And context, as John Dewey, great American philosopher, said, is um, the, the neglect of context is the most important mistake made by philosophers. So I think things only are what they are in respect of a context. And that context is a bed of relationships which makes them what they are. This means that when you think you can understand a whole by taking it apart, um, you have to take into account that the part is only what it is in the context out of which you are now taking it and in relationship to all the other parts. A good analogy of this would be a piece of music. A piece of music is made of notes. If you analyze it and list all the notes in your notebook, well, there's been um, 75 A flats, there have been um, 96 Bs and so on. You won't find the piece of music there, even though you've got all the notes, because music exists entirely in relationship. It's a very good example of what I believe to be, a, you know, it's a very good matter for the structure of all existence, that it exists in relationship. Um, and out of relationship, which is profoundly creative, comes something completely unique. You know, a single piece of music that if it hadn't existed, there'd be a hole in the universe where that piece of music should be. And what that piece of music means can never be meant by anything else. So I think this is a very profound idea. And I, I take it back to, I know you're a great um, um, uh, scholar of uh, Oriental philosophy, so I, I'm sure you would resonate with the image of Indra's net, this idea of a net over the cosmos, um, in which at every crossing point in the net, there is a little jewel in which every other jewel in the net is reflected. So this has the idea of something which is hologramic in, in, or, or, or fractal in its, in its structure, which I believe is, is mathematically, physically and, and philosophically um, likely to be true about the structure of reality. Um, and the, the image of a net immediately helps one to see that it is the threads that give rise to the things, the crossing points that stand out. When we look at a net, we see first of all the crossing points, and it's these that attract our attention, where this bead is, and in which, if we look further, we see the whole thing, actually. But it is actually those relationships that are prior to the things coming into being. And I despaired of finding a physicist who would say this, but I've now found found two physicists who say that, um, I mean, I think a lot of physicists would say this and imply it in their work, but I know of two, David Merman and Piet Hutt, who um, explicitly state that relationships are prior to things. Hmm. Well, that's a fantastic I'm answer. Sorry, go ahead. I'm going to have to go fairly soon, um, Stephen, I'm sorry. So um, uh, I just want that to be taken into account. Okay, I've got time for another question or two, and then I think I must call a halt. I'm sorry. Okay, no, um, no problems there. Um, um, actually, maybe this is then a good, a good place to, to, to end things. Uh, there's a few questions in, in the chat, um, maybe very quickly then. Um, could Ian please comment on the anti-psychiatry movement in general, and are the work of Thomas Sazes and um, R.D. Langs in particular um, and that's from Oswald Spengler. Yes, well, it quite clearly isn't from Oswald Spengler, and that's um, Mr. Spengler's parents had a sense of humour. Um, but at least oh, okay. I, 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 um, <laughs> <laughs> but whoever Oswald Spengler is, um, 
Yeah, I mean, it's slightly <laughs> off beam for tonight, isn't it? I mean, it really has almost nothing to do with anything I've said. Um, for the record, um, I'm a critic of most things, I'm a skeptic of most things, and I'm a critic and skeptic also of the anti-psychiatry movement, skeptical as it may, may be. I'm afraid it's skeptical of many very important things, and I think Thomas Zass has done the world an unservice. I also think that R.D. Lang gave some wonderful insights, but also was quite a problematic figure in some ways. Um, so uh, I, I think that it behoves us to be sceptical of dogma in psychiatry, but not sceptical of psychiatry per se. I spent my, most of my adult life acting as a psychiatrist, and I know from the testimony of my patients, um, hard to say this without sounding self-congratulatory, but I mean, I know from what they've told me how much, and I've seen with my own eyes, how much I've been able to help them through quite conventional psychiatric methods, um, using a combination of therapy with medication and using my insight to see patterns um, and using my experience of life to help them see something different. So, you know, I, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a modest fan of anybody who wants to criticize a dog. Well, I'm a great fan of anyone who criticizes a dogma. But I'm not really a, a, a fan of the anti-psychiatry movement. It's far too cut and dried. It gives rise to a lot of suffering, actually, because um, far too many people are skeptical or reluctant to accept psychiatric help that would change their life for the better. So, you know, I don't know why why that question was put in, really, but that's my answer to it. <coughs> well, I think your, your work is so expansive and so stimulating, and I think that uh, our community eventually would like to, 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 to dive deeper into your work. And no, no, fair enough. Yes, yes, yes. To bring the question to, to the fore and, um, and their curiosities yes. and such. I, I want to thank you on behalf of GCAS and our community to, uh, for your time. This has been wonderful. We appreciate it very much your time and John's time. Um, and I think we should maybe leave it there. Well, the thank best. you very much, uh, John, and thank you very much, Stephen, uh, for your help and your kind words and your enthusiasm and for making this all happen. So thanks thank a lot, and so thanks to people who ask questions. And uh, I'm sorry it had to be such a very uh, superficial and perfunctory overview of a profoundly difficult area. But all I can say is I really would encourage anybody who wants to engage with my ideas seriously to read what I've written rather than simply listen to what I've had time to say tonight. Thank you. Thank you thank so you. much. And Thank Dr. You. Ehrensfeld, there's a there's a question for you, Dr. Ehrensfeld, if you wouldn't mind just responding. And thank you so much, Ian. Really, really wonderful. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to say my Take farewell. Care. Take care. Bye bye Bye-bye then. Bye bye. Thanks again. Thanks again. Yeah, I'd be happy to. I see the question uh, in the chat. Oh, somebody's asked me: Is this all oh, this work of Ian McGilchrist? Uh, uh, relevant to the <clears throat> goals of, of uh, industrial ecology. It's a field that I helped found and, and uh, uh, really directed for a number of years. Um, well, yes, I'd see this work of, of Ian's as, as uh, critical in, in many, many areas. Uh, industrial ecology is one in, in, in which it is, is one of the ideas is so important is to see things in their entirety. Uh, it's really an outgrowth of some of the, the very uh, reductionist ways of looking at a, an industrial e economy. Uh, and it, it, it preaches very strongly the need to take a systemic view, the right brain view of, of the world out there. So I, I, I say that, yes, that, that uh, um, even perhaps more directly than some other fields or subdisciplines, this whole idea of the bihemispherical brain is, is really very important in understanding uh, the, the, the underlying ideas that spawn the, the whole field of industrial ecology. It, it's just a way of seeing uh, all the flows of energy materials uh, in context, to, to use the word that uh, Ian just spoke of. I've written a, a, a couple of books since then my latest book called uh, The Right Way to Flourish 
is is to to our take it actually takes up his arguments in 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 some more practical context. Uh, it really argues much the same as he does that uh, our our society is in in a pretty bad way, and that this way of looking at the world uh, through the a lens of the bihemispherical brain uh, casts a lot of light and, and offers us some uh, wisdom about how to proceed forward without making all the mistakes we've made in the past. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you so much, Dr. Ehrensfeld. We're really excited uh, about you joining with GCAS as a Distinguished Research Fellow and thinking through a seminar that uh, you teach maybe in October, let's see. And uh, I'd like to thank Stephen for, for guiding us today. And uh, that was really a fantastic encounter. Thank you all for joining us on the YouTube channel. We had like 60 folks uh, joining us there and that's really great. And thank you all so much for being part of what we're doing here at GCAS. Very well. Okay, so we'll sign off here, and uh, and that's great. Okay. okay. So thank you all, and yep, yeah, we'll take care. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you, Thelini. Yeah.